Good morning. How are you doing today? It's good to see you. I'm Brian Cox. I'm the executive pastor here. And also, I am Pastor Eddie's youngest brother. Can y'all tell? So when you see him, be sure to tell him we saw your younger brother today. He would like that. Well, a couple of things I want to share with you. It's our special time in our service where we get to give back to God. So when you came in, you should have an envelope. You would take the time right now. You go ahead and fill that out. Also, if you're a first-timer or second-timer, you filled out the card, you can drop it in our offering basket right now. And while you're doing that, I just want to share with you a couple of things. I had a chance to read a story this week. It's about a pastor. His name is D.L. Moody. Some of you may have heard of him. And one day he was preaching, and he got done, and someone asked him, Pastor Moody, do you think anyone made a decision today? He said, yeah, I'm sure they did. At least two and a half people made a decision today. They said, oh, so two adults and a half child, I guess, made a decision today. He said, no, two children and an adult. Because that adult had already lived half his life. Some of us can relate. We've lived half our life. But the two children have the rest of their life to live. How important is our next generation to us? And I've had the opportunity in the last few months to serve in our kids' department, and they're doing a great job, fantastic volunteers and people in there, almost 300 kids each week, doing an identical service at this moment while you're in here, learning the stories that you're learning, learning how to love God, love people and live on purpose also our fifth and sixth grade ministry about 30 of those at the same time each week is that not just an amazing thing that god's doing there but i say that to to just say this as we give today we're not just giving to the power bill we're giving to the next generation we're giving something to them that they can take for the next 50 years so let's pray together Father, we just thank you so much for the awesome opportunity you've given us to serve and to give, for blessing us with the ability to give, and I pray that you would bless each person here, that you would speak to them today, and take what we do today and change a generation. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's nice and warm message from pastor eddie he may have prayed for snow but the earthquake was all god <laughs> uh, one of my roles here as the associate pastor at marathon is that i guess to help oversee kind of the group structure um we that we have here at marathon with our marathon groups we have three different styles of groups that we offer to to you as members and as people who attend marathon uh, the first is what's considered an express group and these are short-term groups that will meet for sometimes they only meet four or five weeks at the longest they meet is sometimes we'll do the beth moore study will go 10 weeks um, these express groups are meant for you to be able to get in and get out on your schedule as quickly as you can and and then wait for the another group to show up uh, there's there's multiple ones even coming up right now with like financial peace with dave ramsey there's going to be an express group coming up that deals with f uh, fitness wellness and health that includes some cooking demonstrations and all of you like to come and see how people cook and eat so you probably want to be part of that one uh, the second style of group we have are what are known as encounter groups and these are more the traditional home group that you're used to seeing um, but as our, our lives have gotten so busy it's hard harder to meet weekly so some of these still meet weekly some meet monthly and some meet twice a month um, and there's multiple groups within there uh, for all different ages and specifics that you can get into and our third ones are discipleship groups which are called our engage groups and those are where we go through the runners curriculum and this time of the year is where we get to push and to make as many of these groups available to you um, so i'd encourage you to stop by and out in the atrium there's a table that has a group brochure in there where you can read through all the different types of group and if you've been looking to get plugged in to a specific group or even if there's a group that you want to to see if we have someone who can help lead or be a part of that you can fill it out and let me know so i can help you get connected into the life of the groups here at marathon also there's this big giant two seven foot boards behind you where uh renee's creative team has helped us put together a way because one of the complaints we hear is oh it's such a big church that i don't feel connected um, well groups will help you get connected 
And then the second thing we want you to do is go to this board and you'll see pictures and your picture may be up there. If it's not, we'll go and take it today and get you up there for next week. And we want you to help us create a, a, a beautiful piece of art, basically, that is going to show how even though we're a large church, the strings that hold us together, we truly are a family that's really connected. Um, and so I encourage you to go and to help us make this endeavor happen and find out more for groups. And now it's time for a quiz. Everyone raise your hand. Prove to me that you're listening and you can raise your hands. Beautiful job. Some of you failed already. That's okay. It's a church. There's forgiveness involved. This is going to be a true or false quiz. Pretty simple. All right? If it's true, Tom, you raise your hand. doesn't matter which one. Just your hand only, not Renee's hand. Just your hand. Okay? True or false? I have cut through a gas station in order to avoid a light. Pretty good. True or false, I frequently look at a clock, a watch, or my phone to see what time it is. Mm. True or false, people who talk slowly irritate me. <laughs> All of you put your hands down real fast after you did that. You're like, yes it does, but I'm not letting anyone know. I become aggravated when people choose to pay with a check at a grocery store. It's a check. It's for paying bills with, not groceries. And if you're going to pay with it at the grocery store, you know you are going to Bilo or Publix or Ingles, so put their name on it before you get there. True or false, I finish other people's sentences. Mm, every husband's urging their wife or vice versa. True or false, I get irrational or upset if I'm running late. Yeah. You, that's why God gave you kids. True or false, I hate to wait at a restaurant. All right, now keep your hands up. This is true or false, you hate to wait at a restaurant. Now those of you that have your hands up, keep them up, keep them up. True or false, I, com I feel compelled to leave now to get to the restaurant so I don't have to wait. <laughs> only, no one, all right, so only a few will sit through the message. You're free to leave if you need to, and we're done. Uh, see, here's what I've, I've come to understand is like, we live life so fast. Okay, that's why everyone enjoyed this week with the snow. And what does everyone say when it snows in the south? Oh, it's so quiet and still and beautiful. Everything just slows down for a little bit. That's because we live life way too fast. That we need God to intervene and shut down grocery stores and roads and then go have fun. Okay? That's what, that's what happens. That's why snow comes. But we live life constantly hurrying, moving to the next thing, except for our spiritual lives. When it comes to our spiritual lives, we hold dearly to the verse of the Psalms that says, Be still and know that I am God. And we wait. We, constantly, we don't want to rush and go to something that God has asked us to do, or, or we're, we're, we can't do that this year, God. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just going to say, are you sure you want me to do that, God? Really, I'm supposed to help that person or oh, forgive that, that family member? Ooh, our God, let's just stop for a second, God. Let's take a step back. You're moving too fast for me. That's right. That's how we approach it. Our rest of our life is as fast as we can. But when it comes to spiritual things, we want it slowed down. We, we, we don't want to move ahead too often. My goal and hope is as we look through this passage, week six, and as you read through chapter six of the story, and we look at this concept of the wanderings and what the nation of Israel is going through, that you will walk away with an understanding that we need to quit waiting on God and consider the fact that he may be waiting on you. Previously in the story of what we've seen take place is God's creation happens and, and man's sin leads to the fall of man and then men continue to sin even though God has a plan to redeem them. They continue to sin to where he feels as if he should destroy all the earth with the flood. Yet he redeems a, a line of redemption through Noah's family 
that gets extended even over to Abraham. Uh, Abraham and God form a covenant, an agreement together in which God is going to use Abraham's family to bless the nations and to, to be a, a bearer of the redemptive line and the history of God's plan for him. And he promises to Abraham that he will never leave him and that he will has a purpose for Abraham to be this blessing. Then Abraham's descendants end up, because of a vast famine, they end up being moving to, to Egypt and staying there as opposed to the land where they were living at. And they get enslaved for a period of time in Egypt, and they begin to cry out to God that they would be freed from this Egyptian slavery. And God delivers them through a man named Moses. And this is what we've been the past couple weeks. And, and the, Moses comes, delivers them, and then gives them the, some rules or borders by which they should live in order to have a healthy, holy lifestyle between God. And we're sitting now in chapter 6 as this opportunity to see what God's going to do with the nation that he has just delivered out of Egypt and how he is going to use them and his plans for them. And, and, and I want you to remember and maybe make note either we're going to be in Numbers 14 for a good bit and the re remaining passages of Numbers going into Deuteronomy. But we can't forget a specific verse in Exodus 3, verses 7 through 10. God had heard the cries of the people who were enslaved in Israel, who were enslaved in Egypt. And he heard them calling out to them and he put together his plan of redemption he delivers them, and he moves them out. And in Exodus 3, verses 7 through 10, we see that he is going to bring them to a land that was good and spacious, a land flowing with milk and honey. God had a plan for his people. It's the same plan and promise that he had given to Abraham that he would send them to a land in which would be prosperous and they would be able to bless the nations and that people would be blessed because of them following God. Now, this plan that God had established had a very interesting way in which he could move the nation of Israel. And as we, as we sit over here in the upper story part of this, God has a, has a route plan that could, be, could move the nation of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. Okay? The distance from Egypt to the land of Canaan is about 175 miles. One of the routes that they could have taken that Isaiah 9 references is called the Way of the Sea. The Way of the Sea is the most direct route, but it's also it's, it's a very well-traveled route. It's very scenic and beautiful. Picture the Pacific coastline. If you've ever seen pictures or maybe yourself have driven up through the road and you just have this gorgeous, traveled, easy road for the nation of Israel to go on that would take them about two weeks to go from Egypt to the promised land. That's the most direct, easiest route would be the way of the sea. But God shows up and he commands Moses and he's telling him, he says, Moses, he goes, I need you to go the way of the desert past Mount Sinai. So instead of taking the most direct route, he sends them to the southern roads and they end up in the desert around Mount Sinai and they actually stay there for an entire year. And that's where God gives the Ten Commandments to them. That's where God begins to develop them. And here's point number one, or the upper story thought that we have to remember. God rarely uses a direct route. God rarely uses a direct route. Over and over through Scripture, we see that God is not in a hurry that he is actually constantly waiting and, and being more patient with the people. When it comes to Noah and building an ark, he, he had to build the ark and then wait for the rain to come. When it comes to Abraham, he had to wait for a son to be born unto his wife Sarah. He had, Joseph had to wait from being humiliated by his brothers to where he ascended to the power as the second highest in command under Pharaoh. He had to wait, even Moses waited for 40 years after leaving Egypt as a shepherd in the flocks of his father-in-law's herd. God rarely uses the direct route, which is completely foreign to me. 
okay? When, when I get in a car and I enter into my GPS, my Google Maps, a destination, it p- turns into a game. When Google Maps tells me it's going to take me 4.25 hours to get to a location, first thought that comes to my mind, I can beat that. (laughs) Men, right? Amen. There's a good amen right there. When we get the plans and directions laid in front of us on the GPS, second thought that goes through my mind, why are they making me take this road? Why would I take this road? It's a whole lot quicker if I take another road because GPS is lie. Every one of us men know this. Our wives tend to disagree, but we understand the GPS lies, and I can beat the GPS. I can use an alternative route and get there quicker. I'm also horrible to travel with. Ask my wife. When we lived in New Orleans and we would travel up here to South Carolina, it's a nine-hour journey to see our friends and our family. When we moved to Pittsburgh, it as well, a whole lot more mountainous, but is also a nine-hour journey from Pittsburgh to South Carolina. When I travel with my wife, this was before we had kids, I would stop one time, usually somewhere around the Montgomery area in Alabama, and usually somewhere around the Virginia, West Virginia border coming out of Pittsburgh. You can make a nine-hour trip stopping only one time, and when you stop, men, what do we stop for? Gas, food, bathroom, get in the car, it's 15 minutes, let's go. It's a race. I'm beating the GPS. You understand what I'm trying to do here, right? Amen. I got a second amen on this. See, here's the thing. is, is and when My kids hate it. When we hate it now because I have to stop for kids. Be, you just, you have to. I've tried not to, and it, it's, it's bad. And it, we'll just leave it at, it's, we drove, it's bad. From the tip of Florida and there's no any bathrooms around, and you, it's just not good. You've been there. You feel what I'm talking about. God is never in a hurry. And in your life, he is probably taking some alternative paths to get you where you need to go. But here's the, here's the story part of this, okay? Even though he's taken the non-direct path, why? Why did he choose to send the nation of Israel to Sinai? It's this old concept of the fisherman he likes to use. He goes, I caught them, but now I got to clean them, okay? He had delivered them out of Egypt, but they still had Egypt in them. So he needed to bring them to Sinai and establish some borders with the Ten Commandments by which they were supposed to live. They couldn't live like the Egyptians used to live because they're Israelites. He had to remind them how to live life. And sometimes we forget that when God is taking us on a different route, other than what we expected, that he is slowing us down to help us remember how we're to be holy and represent him to the world. Now what happens during this journey that takes place is is God's purpose is moving forward and they actually for a year in Sinai they begin to leave to go to the promised land and and Deuteronomy 1 tells us that it's going to take us 11 days to go from Sinai to the border of the promised land. So one year 11 days later after they left the enslaved lifestyle of Egypt, the nation of Israel is sitting on the border of the promised land. And here's what happens in this lower story. God decides to ask Moses to set apart some men to go and to view the land. So 12 spies were sent out to view the land. Now remember Exodus 3, Okay, keep lodged in the back of your mind. Exodus 3, 7. This land is good and spacious. It is full of milk and honey. So he wants them to go see the land that, that's about to be taken and given to them. Okay? Now, if you grew up in the Sunday school world, as if I did, or if your mom just loved VBS songs, you learned the song that goes, Twelve men went out to spy in Canaan. Ten were bad. Two were good. See, no one in the first service remembered. Maybe I just, that's just what happens when you grow up in my household. What do you think they saw in Canaan? Ten were, Joe Looper, you grew up in a Sunday school class and you're looking at me as if you have no idea what I'm doing. Come on, Joe, put your hands up. Ten were bad and two were good. 
All right? So this is what happens. That's, how you, that's the only thing you're going to remember today. But if you remember this, 10, 12 spies go out. 10 spies come back with a message that is bad. Two spies come back with a message that is good. Now let's read what they said in Numbers 14, 1 through 4. Here's the report that they gave. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron and the whole assembly and says unto them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and our children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better to go back to Egypt? A year and 11 days. They're thinking about the, their history. So they say to each other, let's choose a leader and let's go back to Egypt. The report came back. Surely there is milk and honey and the grapes were so big they had to carry them on poles. But the ten also reported that the cities were fortified and that the men were as tall as giants and that there was no way they could defeat these armies and take over the land. Joshua and Caleb, the two that were good, decided, no, if God is there with us, if God is moving in front of us, then we should follow what he has laid out. It is his plan. It is his story that he is writing in our life. Because the people grumbled and complained, God's anger burned within him. Have you forgotten what I've brought you from? Have you not seen the signs and the wonders? Have you not the ones who cried out for me to, for helping you? Yet now you don't trust me. Now you're not willing to follow me. Moses intercedes on his behalf. And in, in Numbers 14, we read that because of the 40 days that the spies sent into the land and they viewed the land, verse 34 tells us that for every day that the spies were in the land, the nation of Israel would wander in a desert. Here's our lower story thought in point number two. Sometimes we live in the space between because of our choices. Sometimes we wander this life because of our choice that I made. You see, the wandering that would take place over the next 40 years though it was made by only 10 men, it affected an entire generation. And God would wait until that whole generation is over. And this wandering between where you are in a desert and where you want to be in a promised land is what many of us have walked through in life. Many of you in this room are, are in this space between, and it describes your life, whether it's between school and graduating and getting an employment and a job, between dating someone and getting married, between being married and choosing to have a family, or, or a diagnosis of a terminally disease and remission, or saying goodbye to a loved one and saying hello in heaven. The space in between is this, this difficult process that we live in. And, and we, we so often lose the fact of the upper story that God has a route and a plan and that he has sent us there to, to refine us and to teach us how to live. We forget the upper story when we're walking through the lower story. And the nation of Israel constantly for the next 40 years complained to God. We should just go back to, Israel, to Egypt. They complained because he would send them blessings of food from the heavens. Even though they weren't in the promised land, they never lost favor with God. Yet they complained about it. Their clothes wouldn't fall apart. They had every provision they needed. When they wanted meat, God sent them meat. When they wanted water, God sent them water. Yet they were not happy we can see why God dealt so harshly with his people. It wasn't that they complained that they had to wander for 40 years. 
In Numbers 14, verse 11, God lays out and questions two things about the choice they made. He says it's because of the contempt they have for him. Contempt is this desire to look down upon someone else that you're better than them, to diminish them, to to disregard them because you think they're better. In this case, the nation of Israel thought they were better and they knew better than God. And he says it's because of your contempt and the choice you make that you will wander. Then he questions their, 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 their belief and their trust in him. And it's not that they lacked faith, okay, because they saw the miraculous signs and they knew the wonders that God was about to do. They didn't lack faith and they didn't doubt the existence of God because he had been there as a fire by night in a pillar of smoke during the day. So they, they knew God existed and they knew that he was going to be powerful and almighty. They just didn't want to obey him because it was inconvenient. Their unbelief was because of an inconvenience of fortified cities with giants on them. So here's the story. Some of the things you're going through in your life are a consequence of the decisions you've made in life. There's been times where you thought and I thought I knew better than God. And there's been times where you thought and I thought that my way is more convenient than God's way. And as a result of those choices, we live in the space between where we are now and where God wants to get us. The nation of Israel made the choice, just like you and I do. We so often forget that God doesn't use a direct route. And and we so often lose sight of what he's trying to do to develop us and to refine us, to get our old lifestyle out of our life and to to begin to to sanctify us and to bring us into the likeness of his son. And, And we make decisions, even though we're still favored and blessed children of God, we make decisions because we're selfish and we think we know better than he does. For the Israelites, it cost them 40 years and an entire generation. Man, our choices have lasting consequences as well. Numbers 26 tells us during a second census how this affected them. In verses 64 through 65, it says, Not one of them was among those counted by Moses and Aaron the priests when they counted the Israelites in the desert of Sinai. For the Lord had told to the Israelites they would surely die in the wilderness. Not one was left except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Moses goes and he prepares the people 40 years later. It was only an 11-day trip and it took them 40 years years and he brings them to the edge of the promised land again and he's he tells them he he's speaking to god as god spokesman to them and he gathers them and in numbers 34 verses 1 through 2 we read that the lord says to moses command the israelites say to them when you enter canaan the land that will be allotted to you as an inheritance is to have these boundaries why is this important Exodus 3. God had planned to give them good land that was spacious, flowing with milk and honey. But because of a choice, they end up with a land 
with boundaries. It wasn't just that they wandered 40 years. They now were going to be confined to a smaller piece of land than what God initially intended for them. It wasn't just that this land was going to be smaller and they were still God's blessed people. They were favored. They would see his hand upon them. They weren't going to have the impact to the rest of the world as what God had intended for them to do because of a choice that they made that they could do life better. Are you listening to me? Do you hear how this applies to us? That this isn't just decisions we, we make with our life to, to rush through our spiritual lives These are or to slow down. The decisions we make when it applies to our life as to what God is wanting to do for us has drastic implications to, to the future of my children, to the futures of the, how God uses me in his kingdom. The land got smaller. And it wasn't until King David A man after God's own heart. Did God allow for the borders of Israel to be expanded? God has a specific story for us. And as I look back over the routes that he has taken me on and the choices where I've chosen not to follow his will, in his problem in my life. I realize that there's sometimes in point number three, I need, I need to stop waiting on God and consider that he might be waiting on me. See, God, I reminded you in January that God has spoken to each and every one of you and has given you a purpose and a plan. And life has come and you have begun to live this out. And you may have acted on what God has called you to do, what God has had purposed and given you a dream to do. And you may have acted upon that. You may not have. But what I can promise you, though, is that if we sit here at the border of of inactivity, we forget that God is already in our future. So often when we look at our lives, we talk about what God has done in our past. We talk about the choices we have made, but we forget that God is in the promised land. The nation of Israel forgot that even though those are fortified walls and cities filled of giants, that God was already given the land to them. They forgot that the future they had was provided and blessed by God. By God. And I forget that so often. When life comes and I'm struggling in the wandering of in between, I forget that my future has God in it too. I've seen what he's done in my past and you have too. But can you begin to imagine what he wants to do with your future? Because you will act differently. You will live differently when you know God has already gone in front of you and has defeated the giants, that he has won the victories. You act differently. You don't back away from a border. You run wide open into it and let God display his mighty powers. It's a completely different thought of how we live when we put God's into the future of my story. Deuteronomy 4, verse 1. Moses is reminding the people of Israel what God wants to do with them. And he tells them, he says, Now hear, O Israel, the decrees and the laws that I'm about to teach you. They're sitting at the edge of the border and they're waiting to go in the second time. And he tells them, follow them so that you may live and you may go in and take possession of the land. The Lord, the God of your ancestors, has given to you. Live, go, take. I'm giving this to you. See that I have taught you the decrees and the laws. I'm giving you these borders by which you should live. They commanded me to do so that you may follow them in this land into your future that you are going, that you can take possession of it. Observe these carefully, for this will show your wisdom and your understanding to the nations. 
Though it is a smaller portion, Israel, you are still have a purpose. You still have a plan. And the nations around you are going to look at you. And this is what they're going to say when they look at you, the nation of Israel. They will say, surely this is a great nation, wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near to them the way the Lord our God is near to us when we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have a righteous decrees and laws as these laws that I'm setting before you today? The land has gotten smaller, but God's purpose still remains. You've made some decisions that have consequences in your life, and the land may be smaller. You may have to live by a certain set of rules on this world because of the decisions you made, but that does not change that God is in your future and that God has a purpose to use you for his kingdom to reach the nations with. You are his image bearer. It's a different route than you expected. And, and there's times we've doubted, but he is still right by your side wanting to be a part of your life. Every way. In every aspect. He is in front of us. Helping us move to the promised land. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning... I know that there are, there are two groups of people in this room right now. There's a first group who are sitting here and the choices you've made to do life on your own, you're tired of doing it by yourself. And you want to do life with God. From here out, you want him to be a part of your future. And if that's you, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Repeat it to yourself as a prayer to God. Dear God, I'm sorry for doing life my way. I'm sorry for the pain and the hurt I've caused to you. I want to do life your way. And I need the forgiveness offered by your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, God. Help me to live my life for you. Now, there's a second group in here. You've been wandering for so long. And you're tired and the space in between has hurt you and pained you and you've lost you've lost sight of the promised land even in their wanderings the people of God were favored and blessed and I need you to hear that and apply that to your life there's been some choices you've made, and it has its consequences, but you are favored and blessed as a child of God. And He wants to be in your future. So you pray this prayer with me if you just need some realignment of heart and vision. Father God, Tired. I'm weak and I'm alone. Father, strengthen me with your food and with your people. Guide me by the light of your word. Teach me how to live to honor you with my life. Father, be in my future so that I can change and move the kingdom. And all God's people said, amen. This morning, either one of those prayers that you prayed, Pastor Roy will be down front.
and would love to talk to you. If you prayed the prayer of salvation, we'd encourage you to mark that on your handout. And there's buckets as you go out the doors where you can drop those off, as well as if you didn't get a chance to turn in your first time handout, you can drop those in the buckets as well. A couple things just in the way of announcements. Next week is a membership class and it will be held right after the second service. We'll have child care and a lunch provided. If you're interested in finding out more about the history of Marathon as well as the vision and our strategy for making disciples, I'd encourage you to be a part of the special class. If it's been a while since you've done it, come anyways and just learn more about how we're moving in this shift we've made over the past two years to making disciples for Jesus Christ. If you would, sign up at guest services. That way we can have an idea of how much food to provide. Secondly, our student ministry, Amped, will be having a parent meeting next Sunday as well. It should only last about 15 to 20 minutes to overview our discipleship weekend called Riot, as well as their summer camp surge. You can get more information and see Jamie at the table today if you wanted to go ahead and sign up your kids for that and speak with him. As we stand to our feet, I want to send you out with the prayer of benediction that may the Lord God bless you. May he keep his hand upon you. May he cause his spirit to shine upon you. And may he be gracious to you. May he lift up his smile and give you peace. Amen? Go enjoy Sunday.